Hello, this is Simon Brew. I'm the editor of Film Stories magazine and a very warm welcome to the Film Stories podcast. Come with me. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In movies, movies that had stories. That the story just sucks a man. This is just the beginning. Film Stories. We would be honored if you would join us. Hello and a very warm welcome to Film Stories with Simon Brew. I am Simon Brew. As always, that's all you need to know about me. The aim of the podcast, though, well, title gives it away. I'm here to talk of the stories of films and I tend to talk about development stories, production stories, marketing stories, release stories, all those ingredients, really, that go towards making the films that we know and sometimes love. Just that, the films that we know and sometimes love. The films I tend to cover on this podcast, they lean more towards the mainstream than anything else. They're films I'm interested in or invested in to some degree. I try not to do snark. I try not to punch down. This podcast is a celebration of cinema and a real appreciation of just how hard it is to get a film off the ground. Enough preamble then. I'm going to zip us all the way forward to 2021 now. A bit of a monster mash this. Let me play you a clip from the trailer. Come to the story, the other side of this. This is our only chance. We have to take it. We need Kong. The world needs him. To stop what's coming. And this child. She's the only one he'll communicate with. I knew that they had a bond. She had nowhere to go, so I made a promise to protect her. And I think that in some way, Khan did the same. And that's a clip from 2021's Godzilla vs. Kong, directed by Adam Wingard. Screenplay credited in the end to Eric Pearson and Max Borenstein, based on a story by Terry Rossio and Michael Doherty and Zach Shields. Starring uh, Alexander Skarsgård, Millie Bobby Brown, Rebecca Hall, Brian Tyree Henry, Sean Oguri, Elsa Gonzalez, Julian Dennison, Lance Reddick, Carl Chandler and Demian Bashir. And when cinema needed a hero to reboot the box office in 2021, it ended up in, well, really, with two of them, a long-awaited mashup of two of Hollywood's biggest ever monsters, uh, even though one of them didn't actually start in Hollywood. But inevitably, there was a story underneath all of this. So we're at Godzilla vs. Kong, and come the early 2010s, legendary entertainment, headed up by Thomas Tull, was a major name in Hollywood. It had been financing and co-producing deals with primarily Warner Brothers, and in fact, back in 2005, it, uh, it announced a deal to co-produce and, fi- and co-finance movies with the Warner Brothers studio that ended up with about 40 movies being done. And one of the last projects to slide under the deal of that, um, as, uh, as Legendary decided to put, uh, well, really get up sticks and move elsewhere, was the Gareth Edwards directed big screen reboot of Godzilla, the Hollywood version of Godzilla that came out in 2014. Now, it came out just as Legendary had inked a similar five-year deal with Universal instead of Warner Brothers, so it was moving home, but the Godzilla project was still with Warner Brothers. Now, one of the first projects that Legendary was working upon with Universal was also a big screen revival for King Kong, who'd been off the big screen since Peter Jackson's mid-2000s, highly expensive, very long and really quite engaging uh, take on the character. That was set up at Universal, but Kong Skull Island, as the new film was ultimately going to be called, would be directed by Jordan Vo Roberts, and it was part of a plan for, what wouldn't you know it, a big monster cinematic universe, because this was, as it is now, the era of the cinematic universe. And if you could get three movies together and connect them in some way, a universe you you duly had. Now, it made some sense in the scheme of the various big monster properties doing the rounds that you could glue them all together. And so that was really the inkling of a plan that was coming that, that was coming to the fore. Because at the time, the film was just known as Skull Island and it had been put together at Universal. But in September 2015, so a year year after Legendary and Universal had started their deal, with it known that a planned crossover universe was being planned, 
came the news that Legendary, surprisingly, had actually moved the Skull Island project away from Universal and back to Warner Brothers. Now, Warner Brothers had was, was off developing other projects of its own, and it was said that there were some in the studio who weren't particularly sad to see the back of Legendary, but Legendary was now back on the Warner Brothers lot with a project. Jordan Faye Roberts came in to direct the movie Kong Skull Island, that would be. Now, as Deadline noted, what this also cleared up with the Skull Island project moving uh, to Warner Brothers was the possibility of a much rumoured King Kong and Godzilla mashup. So the Kong Skull Island project, and I'll come to it in a separate podcast at some point, was dated for March of 2017 by this point. It had a cast in place, including the likes of Brie Larson and Tom Hiddleston. And the deal to switch studios for the project was also cleared with Toho, the Godzilla rights holders back in Japan, so that a mashup movie could happen. And things were now starting to move. Now, a week after the studio shift happened, The Hollywood Reporter ran a piece digging deep and alleging some ha unhappiness between Thomas Tull of Legendary and Universal Pictures. Now, it didn't help that the early 2014 movies under the New Deal hadn't really fared well at all. Uh, As Above, So Below didn't do great. Uh, Dracula Untold, that didn't do great. Seventh Son, Unbroken. I mean, these weren't films that were set in the box office alight. Legendary put money into Jurassic World World, meanwhile, but trade reporting opened up rumours of unrest over who took what amount of credit. In fact, as the, the Hollywood Report piece noted, Toll bought potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in film financing to Universal after his relationship with Warner soured, and this is quoting, amid similar reports of tension over that studio's perception that he grabbed credit for Christopher Nolan's Batman movies and other hits on which he was a financing partner. And the implication seemed to be that Legendary was doing the same again on Jurassic World when apparently, and, and someone from Legendary with expensive lawyers, feel free to refute me, uh, was primarily putting finance in rather than creative direction. Now, Universal, as again, as the Hollywood Reporter noted, did actually have the option to make uh, to make a Kong movie. But the $125 million price tag that would take put the studio off. That legendary was delivering a, a, a run of projects that just weren't hitting and a nine figure investment in a big monster movie where the returns weren't entirely clear. Well, it was just a deal too far. So Warner Brothers moved quickly here, not just agreeing to take on the Kong Skull Island project, but also inking a three picture deal, one that added a further Godzilla film to the mix, as well as the Godzilla and Kong crossover, that the path was now cleared for this particular project to move forward. The deal was that Warner Brothers on, again, on Kong Skull Island was to pay 25% of the budgets on that and also Godzilla and on the eventual Godzilla versus Kong. But it would also stump up for all of the marketing costs. Legendary would pay the rest of the budget. Now, in the end, Kong Skull Island, I've talked about that more than the film we're here to talk about thus far in this particular story, would prove a solid success for Warner Brothers. And it openly seeded future films. I mean, it was not shy if you went through the post credits of that particular film of setting up what was going to come. And basically, the monster universe was in business. Work was underway fairly quickly on what would become Godzilla King of the Monsters which arrived in cinemas in 2019 from director Michael Doherty. Doherty had made the brilliant trick or treat. But in the case of King of the Monsters, well, things didn't work quite as well, that the reviews were not kind for that particular film. Uh, but the movie did still make the kind of cash that didn't quite discourage a further adventure and a further entry in the box set. And it was a good job because the project that would become Godzilla vs. Kong was already underway at that stage. That legendary was getting the screenplay and the story working on it. And also it was leaning into what's become quite a controversial approach to breaking stories and coming up with screenplays and stories for movies in that it was deploying the writer's room approach that fairly common in television, but is becoming increasingly frowned upon in films. And we've seen this used by the likes of Paramount with the Transformers films that it put, put together a writer's room of potential scribes who bashed together all sorts of ideas and then they picked the films they were looking to make. And that was where Legendary was going with a Godzilla vs. Kong project as well. And as The Hollywood Reporter uh, noted, Terry Rossio, who co-written the Pirates of the Caribbean films, was leading the room. 
And joining him, well, there was the writing duo Patrick McKay and J.D. Payne, who'd co-written Star Trek Beyond. At that stage, we're working on a further Star Trek film, which hasn't yet appeared. Uh, Lindsay Beer, she was hired. Uh, Kat Vasco, who was working on an adaptation of uh, the story Queen of the Air. We've not seen that either. Um, T.S. Nolan, who penned the Maze Runner films, um, was also working on Pacific Rim 2 at that stage. Jack Paglin, who'd penned Transcendence, starring Johnny Depp. They've done a bit of work on Alien Covenant as well. And J. Michael Straczynski, who'd created the television show Babylon 5, had also worked on the likes of World War Z and the Sense 8 show that the Wachowskis have put together for Netflix. And so these people were brought together in a room. And the idea was lock their brains together, come up with the story. And at the point it was ready to go, this would fast track the whole process. The idea was break the story for the person who come in at the end and direct and potentially write the film. Um, after all the writers have put in their ideas and um, they've just basically gone backwards and forwards with them, Terry Rossio penned an extensive treatment version of the story and that was enough to make Legendary say, yes, we're going to give this the green light, Godzilla vs Kong is happening. So we'll go back in time a little bit. Let's go back to 2017 because Adam Wingard at that point was a director best known for primarily modestly costed successes such as Your Next and The Guest, a terrific pair of films. Now, he jumped a higher profile fare with 2006 Blair Witch, and he'd made 2017's Death Note that had brought him into the world of visual effects with some aplomb um, for the first time. And in May 2017, he was offered and accepted the job of directing Godzilla vs Kong. Now, this was not his first brush with King Kong, at least, because he'd first come onto the radar of that character and people trying to make film of him in 2013. And Wingard would reveal to Slash Film in an interview that he'd been earmarked by Peter Jackson, that again, the director of the earlier King Kong film, as someone potentially to direct his own planned King Kong 2. Now, what had drawn Jackson to Adam Wingard was the film You're Next, which, again, a really terrific and tight film. I do recommend seeking it out. Simon Barrett had penned that one. And the idea was that Barrett and Wingard would come across. They would get the job of King Kong, too. But in the end, that project didn't really have legs and it petered out in favour of the Monsterverse that we're talking about now. But. Crucially, the meetings that were taking place about the new King Kong film back in 2013 were with someone called Mary Perrin, who was working with Peter Jackson at that stage. But at the point we come to the story again in 2017, well, Mary Perrin was one of the people running Legendary and so was more than familiar with Adam Wingard, had had extensive conversations with him about King Kong before, knew of his love of these films um, and of monster movies. And so Wingard admitted to Slash Film he didn't have to do a traditional pitch to get the film, that the previous meeting between him and Perrin had done a lot of fast tracking of the process. And so he was soon the, the, the key candidate for the director's chair of the film. And Wingard accepted. He took the treatment and went through it that Terry Rossio would then work on a screenplay. Eventually, it was Eric Pearson and Max Borenstein who would write the uh, write the production screenplay of the film. And also putting input into it were Zach Shields and Michael Doherty because they had been putting together Godzilla, King of the Monsters. And it was crucial to Legendary that all this knitted together in some way. The point was that there was a broader bit of world building for the franchise going on, but also a screenplay, a director, everything finally coming together. And also the financing was in place for a budget that was going to be between 150 to 200 million dollars. This was not going to be cheap, but also there was a fair it was a fairly good bet that this would play well all around the world, assuming no acts of God were incoming. So casting wise, in June 2018, it was Millie Bobby Brown and Carl Chandler who were confirmed to be appearing in the film with the rest of the cast fleshing out over the autumn. Brian Tyree Henry, Demian Bashir, Alexander Skarsgård, uh, Elsa Gonzalez and Re Rebecca Hall, they all signed up in October 2018. Uh, Shun Aguri, uh, Lance Reddick and Jessica Henwick were also announced in, two in November 2018, although Henwick in the end would be chopped out of the film. I'll come back to that a little bit later. Now, also, if we, <laughs> I mean, I'm jumping backwards and forwards in time, but just shortly after his, the confirmation of his appointment to direct the film, 
Wingard addressed the issue with big mashup movies because it was known that this was going to be Godzilla versus Kong and we'd sat through Batman versus Superman, we'd sat through Freddy versus Jason and generally the feeling was if you've got a mashup movie with two high value Hollywood or even global cinema properties, it's going to be some degree of a score draw that you get at the end of it. Well, Wingard wasn't having any of that. And he told uh, Entertainment Weekly that he was his, he was keen from the off for his film to actually have a winner. Now, what he also revealed at that stage is he'd also visited the set of Godzilla, King of the Monsters, telling again the outlet that part of me just wanted to go there and see what a $200 million or whatever it's costing movie looked like. And he said, I was kind of relieved to see that at a certain point, movies can only get so big. He said, that's what I got from it. It was really educational just from that perspective. And he was also able to talk to Michael Dirty, who was in the midst of directing a $200 million movie and found a human being at the heart of it. Quite a stressed one, presumably, but that notwithstanding, the pair got on, they got chatting and Wingard could see his way into this. Now, as part of his preparation for Wingard and his team ahead of making the film, well, that involved watching all 30 Godzilla movies to that point, as well as all seven King Kong films. Lots of touch points taken from those, as well as, as Wingard confirmed to Collider, uh, Steven Spielberg's War of the Worlds, that was looked at. Alien Resurrection, interestingly, for its underwater sequences, that was given an extra gorp. And Wingard also confirmed that he was looking to build terrain into the picture and incorporate how each creature would use the terrain and the world that was being built. He was also conscious going into this. It was the first PG-13 movie he'd ever done. Everything else uh, had been R-rated, had not been skewed towards anywhere close to a family audience. And so he was conscious that A, he had to hit that. But also, he wanted to see where the boundaries of it were as well. Now, according to the website Omega Underground, the original start date was due to be uh, October the 1st, 2018. That was when the movie was expected to kick off shooting in Atlanta, in Georgia, in the US. But in fact, it got pushed back for undisclosed reasons. It was November the 12th, 2018 that things got underway. And for a film that's very heavy on visual effects, I don't think that's a massive surprise. It took quite a long physical production for this, that it, the shoot actually went on for the best part of six months. And we don't find that a lot with big blockbuster movies. Now, Wingard went into it knowing that there was going to be a lot of CG. So he wanted to avoid using sets wherever possible. He wanted to bring as much realism in as he could. Um, he knew that that he knew that his two main characters, these two main creatures, were going to be generated by computers. So everything else had to do a bit of extra heavy lifting in there as well. And he didn't want to shortchange audiences. He did want in-camera stuff as much as he could. And it was a shoot that wrapped up in April 2019. Worryingly for Legendary, it wrapped up a, a month before Godzilla King of the Monsters came out and a month before basically Godzilla King of the Monsters spluttered a little bit at the box office because even as Wingard went into post-production on Godzilla vs. Kong, the poor reviews and the underwhelming box office for the Godzilla title were spooking Warner Brothers a little to the point where it instantly started talking about delaying the film from its then planned March 2020 release date to give Wingard and his team a bit more space to get the movie right that they just wanted to make sure the schedule afforded the space to really just, just tune the movie and not make the same mistake twice. Now, there were cutbacks as a result. There were changes in post-production, and that included Jessica Henwick's role just being taken out. And this, in turn, affected Elsa Gonzalez as well, that she gave an interview where she talked about how her role got completely changed in the film. This was to Deadline. And she said a lot of the story got cut out and the story was completely changed. So it was a bummer, she said, because my character had a whole different storyline that went in different routes. Um, for Jessica Henwick, um, she noted that getting cut out of the movie really affected all of the other characters. But it wasn't anything to do with Jessica's character. It was just that the storyline changed because the movie is called Godzilla vs. Kong. And it obviously has to service them. And that's where a lot of the post-production work was going to really refocusing the film that way. Now, Wingard was determined to bring in his cut under two hour running time, which he duly did as well. He didn't want one of those blockbuster films that would just go on for all time. Um, the delay that, allowed, that Warner Brothers ultimately announced moved the film from March of 2020 to November of 2020. And that was seven, eight months of extra time for VFX work. 
they still it didn't make, it didn't stop Wingard having to work hard on getting his cut right. At one stage, it was said that he had a five hour running cut of the film, but he wasn't looking to do a director's cut. He wanted the final running time to, to hit his target. Uh, it comes in at 113 minutes, actually, Godzilla versus Kong. And it's not a case of hitting you with lots of deleted scenes and stuff either. This was the film that he wanted to make in roughly the shape he wanted to make as well. And so promotion could slowly get underway and it looked like all, all plans were going fine. And then the pandemic happened. Now, I suspect you're aware of this pandemic, but this was uh, this impacted an awful lot of movies of which Godzilla vs. Kong was one of them. I mean, the promotion had already started, uh, started in May of 2019 for the film as well. And as early as February 2020, that, that there was all sorts of tie-ins that were being announced and that were being pushed out. But deep in the corridors of Warner Brothers, decisions were being taken that would affect the release of Godzilla vs. Kong, as well as every movie that Warner Brothers had planned for the, now 2021. Because with cinemas being closed, it was clear Godzilla vs. Kong could not release in 2020. And so Warner Brothers made the big tactical decision that it would debut all of its 2021 release slate in cinemas and on its HBO Max streaming service in the US on the same day. Now, this decision went down like in many quarters, like a metaphorical fart in a very small car. It's said to be the reason that Christopher Nolan ended his 20 year relationship with Warner Brothers and why his next film, Oppenheimer, has been set up at Universal instead. Uh, Denis Villeneuve was reportedly not happy at all that his Dune movie was now going to be available on streaming a day after it was uh, released on the big screen. And it was felt that Warner Brothers was just selling cinema short. Still, it inked a release date. March the 21st, 2021 was when Godzilla vs. Kong was finally going to be released after pandemic delays. And it was one of the first big blockbusters of 2021, at least, to make it to the big screen in some degree of tact. And it turned out it was a real beacon of hope in the end for the cinema industry. So, I mean, let's just look at the reception of it first, that the, the reviews for the film were, I mean, they, they, they were all right. I mean, it, the title gives you what you, it tells you exactly what you're going to get and you get it. Godzilla vs. Kong is a very loud, very, uh, very upfront film, which does include Godzilla and Kong having a massive scrap with some human beings in the midst of it. Um, entertaining, certainly. And that's why, I, I mean, the reviews were certainly kinder than they were for the previous Godzilla movie. And it, just fun. I think that was a fair summation of it. Surprisingly, though, even though it was appearing on HBO Max on the same day it was in cinemas, Godzilla vs. Kong ended up with quite an impressive opening weekend. In fact, that is an understatement of and a half, because given where cinema was at that point in the spring of 2021, the full opening weekend in the US of April the 2nd to the 4th was an incredible result, a $31 million opening at a point where no other film in the top 10 grossed more than $3.5 million. And in fact, if you go back a week before Godzilla vs. Kong opened up, uh, the top film was Nobody, which had opened in first place. And Nobody is a really fun action film, but it opened with $6.8 million. The Disney film, Raya and the Last Dragon, uh, I mean, it taken a month to get to $30 million. Chaos Walking had been around for ages on the Lionsgate slate, and that was now four weeks in with $11 million in the tank. And the weeks leading up to the release of Godzilla vs. Kong was something of a graveyard of big, of, of big and small films that were just struggling to get people out back out of their homes and into a cinema. Now, as much as Godzilla vs. Kong had a massive hit, was a massive hit on HBO Max for Warner Brothers as well, it was the fact that it delivered in cinemas that was crucial. And even its second weekend of 13.8 million um, saw a drop of only 56% 56, 56 of its audience. I mean, hefty, but nowhere near as hefty as you might expect. Um, and that was with films such as Nobody Still Around and Voyagers Opening, Tom and Jerry, The Courier, The Crudes, A New Age, just a bunch of films that weren't really heavily competing on that scale. And so Godzilla vs. Kong could sit at the top of the chart right until Mortal Kombat toddled along at the end of April with 23 million. But crucially for Hollywood, this film, this was a film that crossed $100 million at the domestic box office. 
100.9 million in the US and then another 369 million outside of the US. Here was a film that had brought in nearly half a billion dollars of worldwide takings in spite of being available on streaming, in spite of being widely pirated as well. I mean, let's say it. Um, the film had really offered fresh hope that people would come back out for, for, for blockbuster movies, that they still, even if they could watch a film at home, if you gave them the right movie, they would turn up in cinemas. Now, of course, the, the aftermath of it was really quite bumpy, that not there were many blockbusters that failed. There were certainly many films and dramas aiming at older audiences that didn't get people out of their homes and didn't get bums on seats. But Godzilla vs. Kong, that was one that did to the point where in March of 2022, Godzilla vs. Kong 2 was announced. And again, Adam Wingard was coming back and he this time brought in his, uh, his old mate from the guest, Dan Stevens. Now, at the point of this being recorded, Godzilla vs. Kong It 2 is about 11 months away from release. But still, no matter how that film turns out, the, the existence of just this monster mashup at a time when Hollywood needed a big movie to go out onto screens and get people to pay to see it. Well, the fact that it did that and the fact that it did that when nobody else was really doing it on anything like that scale, well, it's earned its place in modern blockbuster history. A couple of parish notices then. That, um, I mean, if you like this podcast, three things really. Number one, if you really like it and want to put some funds towards uh, towards the research of it, towards the Film Stories Project, if you head over to patreon.com slash Simon Brew, you get the podcast early pretty much every week. You certainly get it ad free as well. You find out the gossip of what we're up to behind the scenes. You get early notice of upcoming episodes and interviews as well. That's patreon.com slash Simon Brew. Costing you absolutely nothing? Well, if you could subscribe to this podcast, to your podcast home of choice, that helps me enormously. Likewise, if you can leave ideally a hugely positive review, all of these things are, are just big contributors to this podcast getting this far. We're into episode nearly 310-ish at the point this is being recorded. You can find details of all upcoming Film Stories live events at filmstories.co.uk. If you tap the live events tab at the top there, you can get all the ticket details. Look forward to hopefully seeing quite a few of you there. Got some really good guests lined up as well. And then we publish Film Stories magazine. You can find that and all of our magazines at store.filmstories.co.uk. And that brings me to the end of this latest episode of Film Stories. As always, thank you so much for listening and thank you for your time. If I've not bored you completely, you can find more from me on Twitter at Simon Brew. You can find more at the, on the entire Film Stories project at Film Stories. We're on Facebook at facebook.com slash filmstoriesonline. We're at YouTube at youtube.com slash filmstories. Our online shop is store.filmstories.co.uk with over 50 issues of assorted magazines that we've produced available to purchase there. And our website is filmstories.co.uk. That's where you'll find a, a, every day, every weekday at least, an update of news, movie uh, movie news, reviews, features, things, uh, things like that really, and mischief that we're up to. The most important thing, as always, is that you all take care and you all look after yourselves. I will be back soon with another bunch of film stories. Until then, I'm off to watch a bunch of movies. You all take care. Thanks for listening. Bye bye.